So you gotta let me know if this thing's on or not because I, I need it to is. see comments yeah. and all that. Uh, last that week right, we had problems with it. That um, right there is well, just. Hopefully it's on. So welcome it is. to uh, the simple truth. And today we're going in. We're continuing on where we left off last week. Last week we finished chapter two. So today we're going to dive into Luke chapter three, verses one through six. Let's go ahead and read. So Luke chapter three, starting with verse one. Now in the fifteenth year of the reign of Tiberius, Caesar Pontius. Uh, Tiberius Caesar, sorry, uh, he replaced Augustus Caesar, and actually he started his reign um, at about the year 14. So what, what Luke's going to explain right now is we're about in the year 29, when you boil it all down. So verse 1 again, now in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, Herod being tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip tetrarch of Iturea, and the region of Trachonitis, and Lys, uh, Lysanias, tetrarch of Abilene, while Annas and Caiaphas were high priests, the word of God came to John, the son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. And he went into all the region around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins, as it is written in, in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, saying, The voice of one crying, In the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill brought low. The crooked places shall be made straight, and the rough ways smooth. And all flesh shall see, the, shall see the salvation of the Lord, our God. The salvation of God. So, Tetrarch is actually a ruler of a quarter. It was a way of dividing a, a place up into fourths. So, if you're a ruler, a Tetrarch, you're a ruler of a quarter of something. Like, if you divided America up, up side to side and up and down. There would be a tetrarch of the southwest, a tetrarch of the southeast, a tetrarch of the northwest and northeast. Um, so that's that's who these guys were. The kingdom is divided up into quarters. Um, I want to flip back before I actually go into anything else and read a similar passage out of Matthew. So I'm going to go to Matthew chapter 3 real quick and read the same verses 1 through 6. So Matthew 3, 1 through 6, says this. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying, In the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Now, John himself was clothed with camel's hair, with a leather belt, around his waist, and his food was locust and wild honey. Then Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region around the Jordan went out to him and were baptized by him in the Jordan, confessing their sins. <clears throat> so, in verse 2, of back to Luke chapter 3, we have the calling of God on his life. Didn't we? Or is that Matthew chapter 3? No, the word of God came to, to John, the son of Zechariah. And I want to read a little bit about the calling of God. It's something that you know, we've experienced and come across in the Bible. If you're a student of the Bible for any length of time, you realize the call of God is something you just can't ignore. If you think you can, just ask Jonah. He'll let you know what about that call of God that you can ignore. If you turn to Jeremiah 20, verse 9, it says this. Then I said, I will not make mention of him. So Jeremiah is saying, I'm just going to shut up. I'm not going to talk about God. Nor speak any more in his name. Then he's like, but his word was in my heart like a burning fire. Shut up in my bones. I was weary of holding it back. I couldn't. I could not. So there comes a time when the call of God is on you, and you know it. You try and hold it back, try and keep shut, but you just can't. You've got to speak it out. There just comes a time when it demands you speak up and speak the word of God. And this was that time. John looks around, and he sees the condition of Israel, and he feels the call of God on his heart, and he knows it's time to start standing up and doing something now. 
And that's what he does. So after 400 years of silence, all of a sudden, here comes John out of the wilderness preaching his gospel. Hey, repent and be baptized to wash away your sins. So I want to look at that ministry of repentance real quick. So he did that. He went around to all, into all the region around the Jordan preaching a baptism of repentance. Um, who else taught repentance? It started with Solomon in his prayer in 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 47. Uh, he taught repentance. If we repent, Lord, in turn, would you hear from heaven and heal the armies? You know, if we go out and fight, Lord, and we realize we've sinned and we're defeated, if we repent, would you then hear and rescue us? Job taught repentance in dust and ashes at the sight of God in Job 4. 42, I'm sorry, Job, yeah, 42, verse 6. God called Israel to repentance through Ezekiel and Ezekiel 14, verse 6, and Ezekiel 18, verse 30. He taught them to repent and turn. He basically explained what repentance was when he taught it there. It was repent and turn. And in that, those days they had a problem with idolatry. So his teaching was repent and turn from your idols. Joel taught repentance in Joel 2, 12-14. John, of course, taught repentance. Jesus also began his ministry. Uh, if you look at Matthew 4, 17, that's the first thing he said. After his wilderness temptation, the next thing Jesus said was, Repent. Peter. What's the first thing out of Peter's mouth? You know, when they asked him, What do we do? When he was filled with the baptism of the Holy Spirit, he's preaching. And they say, what do we do? He said, repent. Acts 2.38. As did Paul, he also taught repentance. Acts 29.19 and 20. And again, lastly, you have the climax of repentance taught in the book of Revelation, chapters 2 and chapters 3, seven times Jesus calls the church to repentance. So the, the word of repentance and the ministry is all through the Bible, both Old Testament and New Testament. It was taught to Jews, Gentiles, Christians. Can you believe that? Even the church had to be retaught repentance again because even the church slipped from grace. He taught this with baptism, and when he taught it, he taught it with fruit. Baptism uh, was a way of showing your sign of repentance. And this was God's word to man after 400 years of silence. Repent. Let's go ahead and continue on. Start at verse 7. Luke chapter 3, verse 7. Then when he said to the multitudes that came out to be baptized by him, Brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore bear fruits worthy of repentance, and do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I say unto you, God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. And even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Therefore every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So the people asked him, saying, what shall we do then? He answered and said to them, He who has two tunics, let him give to him who has none. And he who has food, let him do likewise. The tax collectors also came to be baptized and said to him, Teacher, what shall we do? And he said to them, Collect no more than is appointed for you. And likewise the soldiers asked him, saying, And what shall we do? So he said to them, Do not intimidate anyone or accuse, any false, accuse falsely. And be content with your wages. So who were the multitudes? John starts off talking about multitudes coming to him. And I kind of want to break that down and talk about exactly who they were. Um, if we look at John 8.31, the phraseology helps explain who these multitudes were. John 
John 8, 31 says this, Then Jesus said to those who believed him, If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. They answered him, We are Abraham's descendants, and have never been in bondage to anyone. How can, how can we be made free? Or how can you say, we will be made free, or something? Um, so, in that, in trying to figure out who these multitudes were, they said, we are Abraham's descendants. And that's part of who the crowd was who came to him. If you go back to Luke 3, verse 8, they said, we have Abraham as our father. And in that chapter, that part, portion of John, then Jesus said to those Jews, it was the crowds of Jews, the leadership primarily who were coming out to him, who were saying, we are Abraham's descendants in eight, John 8, 33. If you want to go back to Matthew 23, it also helps qualify who those crowds were that came to him. In Matthew 23, the same two verses, 31 and thir through 33, explain that. So Matthew 23, 31 says, Therefore you are witnesses against yourselves that you are the sons of those who murdered the prophets. Fill up then the measure of your father's guilt. Serpents, brood of vipers. So there's another phrase to help qualify who they were. The brood of vipers. How can you escape the condemnation of hell? So it's those people that came to him, the Jewish leadership, uh, the, the people who thought they had it all together, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, who were accusing Jesus. Uh, these were the ones that came out to John, trying to figure out who he was, and were being baptized. And John was saying, hey, who warned you to come out? Who told you about all this, about repentance? So, but John didn't turn anybody away. If they came out to him, he dunked them. <laughs> that was it. So be baptized. Repent for your sins. This obedience is kind of paradoxical in that it requires faith to obey. And obedience brings and produces faith. It's kind of like it happens at the same time. Consider Peter getting out of the boat. Did he have faith to get out of the boat before he obeyed? Or did his obedience produce the faith to get out? Which came first? I think it was an instantaneous thing. And that if you want faith, you have to exercise obedience. That's what produces faith. Uh, consider Peter and John leaving their business, their income, everything they knew when Jesus said, follow me. They obeyed, and then in that instance of leaving everything, it cost them a lot. They got up and left their income, left everything, and followed Jesus. And that's where faith came in, after the obedience. Consider Matthew the tax collector. Matthew, follow me. He got up from his income, from his business of tax collecting, left everything, to answer the call. So which came first? The faith to answer the call or uh, to obey or the obedience. Did that produce the faith to do this? I think it's uh, it's an instantaneous thing. When you make that decision, that choice, in, in spite of how it looks, because it didn't look too well for Peter, John, Matthew, leaving all that they had, their business and everything, to all of a sudden get up and follow Jesus, knowing not knowing their future, totally uncertain. Who knows what this brings? All we know is this guy doesn't have a place to lay his head. That's where I think true biblical faith comes in. It's in the act of obedience, especially when you answer the call of the Lord and it costs you. Consider the others who were called out of their occupations. Uh, who Some wanted to go back. Lord, let me go back and do this. Lord, let me do that. Let me go first bury my... My father, let me go first bid my friends farewell. What was Jesus' thing? He said, no, let the dead take care of their own. Mm -hmm. And if you put your hand to the plow and turn back, you're not fit for my kingdom. If you're going to answer the call, you do it. And you don't look back. And that requires a huge 
measure of faith. Now that which saves is that's the most important. Faith, yes. And so also repentance requires faith, which produces actions. And faith requires repentance, obedience. It's, a, it's the same thing. Do you have faith to repent, or does your repentance bring faith? It's the same thing. It's obedience. And whatever your obedience is in repentance um, or, or following Jesus, it will bring that faith. Earthly associations will not save you. Okay? Um, denominationalism, uh, which my mentor, Mr. Watchman Nee, teaches against, um, removes you from the body of Christ. He put it, he put it this way. I want to read. I, I don't want to misquote him. So I want to read what Mr. Nee said. So Watchman Nee says this. One who has seen the body of Christ and who thus possesses the consciousness of the body, feels unbearable inside when he does anything which may cause division or separate God's children. For he loves all who belong to God and cannot divide his children. Love is natural to the body of Christ, whereas division is most unnatural. It is just as in the case with our two hands. No matter how many reasons one hand may be raised against the other hand, there is no way to sever their relationship. Division is simply impossible. Perhaps a person is proud of himself for being one who has left a sect and thus deems himself to be a person who knows the body of Christ. As a matter of fact, however, leaving a denomination is not necessarily the same as or an indication of seeing the body of Christ. It is quite true that whoever discerns the body is delivered from denominationalism. But who can claim he has apprehended the body of Christ simply because he has left a denomination? Outwardly, many have left a denomination, yet they simply set up another kind for themselves elsewhere. Their leaving the denomination merely demonstrates their own latent feeling of superiority. They fail to comprehend that all the members of the body and their brothers and sisters are, are brothers and sisters and therefore are loving. For this reason, let us realize that all sectarian spirit, divisive attitude, outward action, or inward thought which separate God's children are the unfailing signs of not knowing the body of Christ. In another book, he made it a little more sharp. And he explained that to put yourself into a denomination takes you out of the body of Christ. Because in Christ, there is no division or denominationalism. So, the body of Christ is the body of Christ. It is one. It's one. So, what John, what John was explaining here is, um, is don't say to yourself that we have Abraham as our father. You cannot look to an association, well, we were this, or well, we're that. Nothing on earth matters towards your salvation. The only thing that matters towards your salvation is are you in the body of Christ with all the other millions of us around the world, whether they're Chinese, Indonesian, Canadian, Hispanic, doesn't matter. We're all the body of Christ. One. And that's, that's it, it just baffles me how the enemy has had so much success in dividing the body of Christ, putting us at one next to another. So somebody wants to become a Christian. Where do they go? Well, I can't go to this one because they say, unless you're baptized this way, you can't be part of us. And this other church over here says exactly the same thing. I got to be part of them. And if I'm not baptized their way, I can't be part of them. And another one says the exact same thing. They all say the same thing. Every denomination says we are the right one. And in fact, none of the denominations are the right one. One is the right one. One faith one body, one baptism, one Holy Spirit into which we are all baptized. That's it. There is no other. And John does that, lays the axe to the root and says, hey, you guys, you cannot put faith in being born a Jew because there are stipulations even on that. Have you been circumcised? Well, then you're not really a Jew. Do you attend the three feasts that Moses commanded in Numbers? 
every year as a good Jew should, or else they said, no, you're cut off from your people. You see all the requirements and all the, the rigmarole and stuff you have to do? No, it's one body, and you're either in or you're part of a denomination. So choose you this day who you're going to serve. Um, thank you, Mr. Nee, for your words, and uh, I'm sure when we get to heaven, um, I, I'm going to run. After, after I spend about four billion years at the feet of Jesus, um, thanking him for having mercy on, on a, a worm like me, I'm going to find Mr. Nee and shake his hand, and, and I'm going to start introducing, hey guys, uh, you remember when we were talking about this in the Bible study? Mr. Nee. I'll show it to you when we get there. Um, I have a note about verse 9. What did verse 9 said? And now the axe is laid at the root of the trees, therefore every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. These religious leaders were relying on their being born Jews for their salvation. But John is calling them out and teaches the teachers first. He addresses the leadership. I want to go to 1 Peter real quick. And somewhere, I missed my verse 5, my James verse. Yeah, about repentance and bearing fruit. I'm going to back up a little bit. In James 1, speaking of repentance and bearing fruit, James 1, 22, of course we all know this, but the doers of the word, but be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror, for he observes himself and goes away and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the word, of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. If anyone among you thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his own heart, this one's religion is useless. And I did not intend to really get on this, but this goes into verse 16, which we're not talking about today, uh, dealing with the baptism and the Holy Spirit. The first thing, the first sign that's, that, that typically accompanies us all through Scripture is a change in the person's language. When they're baptized in the Holy Spirit, what's the first thing that happened? Tongues of fire fell on them, and they started talking something else. It's more often than not, it's a change in speech. What happened to Peter as soon as he was baptized in the Holy Spirit? He started preaching like he had never preached before. Okay? And at that preaching, 3,000 people were saved. Um, but but it, repentance is always followed up with works. If you go a little further down in chapter 2 of James, verse 14, it says, What does a prophet, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to him, Depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give him the things which are needed for the body, what does a profit? Thus also faith by itself does not, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, You have faith, and I have works. Show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that there is one God? You do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. But do you want to know, O oh foolish man, that faith without works is dead? So he's, he's going to go into this with them pretty heavily. That if you really want this baptism, it has to be followed up. Because then they said, what do we do? And he answers the, the question, what do they do? Verses 10 and 11 went back to Luke 3. If we review verses 10 and 11. So the people said to him, What shall we do then? He answered and said to them, He who has two tunics, let him give to him who has none. And he who has food, let him do likewise. Uh, John gives some practical examples of expressing repentance. Which are the same practical actions that we just read about in James. If you see somebody who, who needs, you give it to them. You don't hold back. Uh, 12 through 14, this is where he really gets into it. Um, when tax collectors came to him and soldiers came to him, these were two really despised groups in Israel. Tax collectors and the soldiers. 
the treacherous in Israel, the treacherous Jews were working the traitorous ones for Rome as tax collectors. And then you had the occupying soldiers. But notice that John did not call them out of their job. He didn't say stop collecting taxes. He didn't say stop being a soldier. He said in your job, in that occupation, do it with honesty and integrity. If you have to work for the IRS, be honest about it. Be fair about it. Don't be like past administrations who have used the IRS to attack certain groups and prevent them from, from being a 501c3 company, you know, with volunteer status. Uh, it, it, it's not right. If you're going to have an occupation and do a job, do it with integrity. If you're going to be a politician, have integrity. If you lose your integrity, you've got nothing. Notice how John did not call them out of their jobs, but simply said to them, be honest in your tax collecting. And to the soldiers, be content. As we need to work with honesty and integrity and being above reproach and have an unimpeachable character, you can't call yourself a Christian and cheat the time clock, steal time from your employer by wasting it on social media, or doing substandard work instead of the very best work as unto Christ. And then call yourself a Christian? And misbehaving like that? It, 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 doesn't, it doesn't gel. You know, it just doesn't click. Um, if you're going to be a Christian, you've got to walk the walk. Or simply take the bumper sticker off your car. You, you can't have a, a Jesus Saves bumper sticker be driving 90 miles an hour down the freeway. Just take the bumper sticker off. Don't embarrass Christ. A Christian's work ethic must be the highest and best the world has ever seen. Regardless, it doesn't matter what kind of an employer you work for. The employer, there's no qualification in the Bible for employer. It goes from one end to the other. Okay, the Bible talks about all employers the same. Whether they're slave masters or whatever, it doesn't matter. All employers should be treated the same by Christian workers. No matter what your lot in life is, it's do your best. Be that example. Because in so doing, you will keep coals of fire on their head. So verse 15 is kind of interesting. And this is the last verse we're going to study today. In Luke chapter 3, verse 15, it says, Now, as the people were in expectation, all reasoned in their hearts about John, whether he was the Christ or not. And this is interesting. I have forgotten another verse. 1 Peter 4.17. Let's go digging. For the time has come for... Oh, yeah. Why, why, uh, why is John so harsh and Jesus so harsh to those coming out to them, calling them brood of vipers and stuff like that? Why were they so hard on them? These leaders? Um, in Peter, it kind of explains a little bit. For the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the end to those who do not obey the gospel? Which is an interesting verse. When the Lord comes down with judgment, he doesn't go to sinners first. He'll clean up his own first. And he comes to the church and he'll get the sin out and do his work amongst them. You can read chapters 2 and 3 of Revelation and get a really clear picture of Jesus doing that in his church. Cleaning it out. And it's about time, instead of um, coming out of the closet, we clean the closet. That the church cleans up her act. So the people were in expectation. Fascinating verse. What were they in expectation of? Why? What's going on? Um, this is where it gets really, really interesting. Uh, so I'm probably going to... End with this, Daniel chapter 9. If you want to turn there, this is the last part we're going to read, Daniel chapter 9. Daniel 9. Yeah, you can find it. Want me to help you? Uh, Daniel 9. Um, it took place, if you read the beginning, it says, in the first year of Darius, son of Hazarus of the lineage of the Medes, 
who was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans in the first year of the reign of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by the books the number of the years specified by the word of the Lord through Jeremiah the prophet that the word that, that he would accomplish seventy years in the desolations of Jerusalem. Um, I probably should have broken this down a little better in my notes. Well, so what was going on there? In Jeremiah, the Lord told them, Jer Jerusalem is going to be desolate for 70 years. Well, when, in the beginning of Daniel, when he went into captivity, it was, the, it was Nebuchadnezzar's reign. And now it's the beginning of Darius. It had been 67 years since that prophecy. Does that sound like it's getting close to a change? So he read in Jeremiah, it's only going to last 70 years. And right now, in Daniel's time, it was, it was year 67 of that 70. So he's like, oh, wow, it's getting close. What does he proceed to do? For the next many, many, many verses, he sets his face on the ground and prays in repentance to the Lord for his sins and the sins of his nation. Because, you know, the time for the restoration of Jerusalem is near. It's getting close, and the Lord's about to move and do something, bring about some changes. In Daniel's time, he was an expectation. And that's what it led him to do, was to pray. So he was getting ready to return to Jerusalem by praying and confessing his sins and his nation's sins. Um, near the end of his prayer, he is visited by, verse 20, Now while I was speaking, praying, and confessing my sin, and the sin of my people, Israel, and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God, for the holy mountain of my God. Yes, while I was speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel, and the crowd goes wild, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, reached me about the time of the evening sacrifice, and he informed me and talked with me, and said, O oh, Daniel, I have now come forth to give you skill and understanding, at the beginning of your supplications, the command went out, and I have come to tell you, for you are greatly beloved. Therefore, consider the matter and understand the vision. So now, uh, in 924 and on, we have Gabriel's explanation of a vision that was already given to Daniel that he didn't know about. It was given to Daniel previous, previously. So this passage is... The expectation. Verse 24. And Chuck Missler goes crazy over these four verses. He says, if you can grab these four verses and understand them, you can understand any prophecy of the Bible. This is kind of like the Rosetta Stone, if you will, of biblical prophecy. If you can grab these ones, it unlocks everything else. Verse 24. Gabriel says, 70 weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city to finish the transgression, to make the end of sins. We're in Daniel chapter 9. Dan, uh, Daniel 9, verse 24. It's not in my book. No. Turn back um, one page. Oh, chapter 9. Okay. Yep. Um, yeah, it's looking well. No problem. To make an end of sins, uh, the rest of that verse, 24, says, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Know therefore, verse 25, Daniel 9, 25, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and sixty-two weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall, even in troublesome times. And if you know your Ezra and Nehemiah, that's exactly what happened. So in, in verse 24 and on, we have Gabriel's explanation of that vision that Daniel already saw. So verse 25 explains a period of time. 483 years. Daniel 9.25 Know therefore and understand from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem. Until the prince, there shall be seven weeks and 62. That period of 69 weeks is 483 years from the command to rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah. 
Um, right now, when John's baptizing in the wilderness and talking to these brood of vipers, it's year 480. It's the same thing as when Daniel had realized, hey, it's year 67, three years and the Lord's going to move. Right now, when John's baptizing, it's year 480, three years and the Lord's going to move. The people were in expectation. They knew this prophecy. They knew what Daniel said, that, hey, in 483 years from that command to rebuild Jerusalem was going to be Messiah. They were there. They were waiting. They were wondering, is this it? Is John the one? So the people were excited. They were in expectation. It's going to happen soon. And in three years exactly to the day Somebody rides into Jerusalem on a donkey and they took palm branches and waved him in and they laid down their garments for him to ride on, on the donkey. And they said, Hosanna, blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. A title reserved for the Messiah. And right there he rides in. It was the only time he allowed himself to be treated like the king he deserved to be. He was. The only time. And it was on the exact day that was predicted. That's why they reasoned in their hearts and wondered about John. Is John the one? And John said, oh, no, no, no. There's coming one after me. I'm not worthy to even undo his shoes. So next week we're going to continue with verse 16. I wanted to pause there because 16 is kind of packed and I really didn't want to stop and, and get into something that I'd only be halfway able to do um, in talking about the one who's coming to baptize with the Holy Spirit and fire. And so we're going to get into that a little bit next week. So thank you for joining us. And for those of you who are watching this at some other time other than today, it's Mother's Day. So happy Mother's Day to everybody out there. And we'll see you again next week.